Thank you everyone for coming in today. Um, we'll go, go ahead and get started with our presentation today. So, Dr. Stagg and I are very excited today for the presentation. I know Dr. Rostro spent quite a bit of time arranging this as well as Alicia. So thank you all for making the time to come in today. Um, I think today we have a really unique uh, discussion and and presentation to kind of go over. So it's kind of going to be a two-part thing. First will be Dr. Bakken on um, his topic of consent necessary for research with bioethics. And then after that, we'll have an sort of open discussion led by Dr. Jacobson with regards to some of the points that Dr. Botkin raises. Um, so you can certainly you know, interrupt Dr. Botkin if you would like to during this presentation, but we'll also have a very uh, time for plenty of discussion for the afternoon, so you can feel free to hold your questions till the end. Um, to say that I feel insufficient to be able to introduce Dr. Botkin, I think is a very fair statement. Dr. Botkin is very accomplished. As you can see from our notes, uh, in terms of the letter here, he has a number of positions here at the university, which he's a professor of pediatrics. He's also the chief of the division of medical ethics um, here at the university, and is an associate vice uh, professor or vice president for research here at the university. So his expertise in this area at the university level is uh, obvious, but I think also important to know is sort of his national expertise in the area. So um, he is a former chair of the Committee for Bioethics uh, for the American Academy of Pediatrics. He's worked with the NIH on their embryonic stem cell working group and has been the chair of that in the past. Uh, he's worked with the FDA and the Pediatric Ethics Advisory Committee. Uh, he's a fellow of the Hastings Center, which is a nonpartisan uh, bioethics sort of foundation, and he's also served on multiple committees for the as a secretary advisor uh, to the health cabinet. So his expertise in the area of bioethics is, I think, unmatched in terms of anything that we have here, and I'm very excited <coughs> to have the opportunity to present. Dr. Swan, thank you so much for that introduction. This is a great pleasure, and. Uh, um, Great pleasure to work with my colleague and mentor, uh, Jay Jacobson, uh, who's been so uh, instrumental uh, in uh, my career here at the university. So I'm gonna talk about a set of issues uh, this morning that uh, I think are some of the most interesting and, uh, and uh, conceptually interesting as well as important uh, in the interface between ethics uh, and uh, biomedical research. So no external financial relationships that have anything to do with uh, my talk today. So here's my objectives. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about federal regulations and uh, some of the proposed changes in federal regulations that many of you may be uh, familiar with that um, may come to fruition a little bit later this year. Talk about some of the challenges relevant to informed consent and then talk about what I think is a, a creative approach to think about our obligations uh, and opportunities in this uh, respect. Now these objectives could uh, probably hardly be more boring. Uh, and so, um, again, I want to emphasize that this is, for the reasons I'm going to try to emphasize, one of the most conceptually interesting and challenging areas. The proposed federal regulations that came forward last year uh, were um, several hundred pages, and half of that had to do with biospecimens and how we engage uh, patients as well as research participants about uh, use of their biospecimens. So here's a question that's going to frame uh, the talk more broadly. <clears throat> is it ethically appropriate for academic health centers to retain and use <coughs> residual clinical biospecimens for research purposes? How much, and if we do so, how much should patients know about this practice? And further, should patients be asked their permission? So here's why this is particularly uh, challenging. Research with biospecimens is removed in time and place from the source individual. Now the research regulations were written at a time uh, where they had a, quite a few um, uh, brilliant and experienced individuals who were participating in the development of those regulations, but they couldn't anticipate uh, the full spectrum of research, particularly as it has evolved over time. And most of those regulations are framed with the expectation that you would have the investigator sitting with the potential research participant and talking about the, uh, the proposed protocol. You'd have an opportunity to walk through the basic elements of informed consent. Folks would make a, 
uh, choice about whether to participate or not. So that direct interface is an assumption that is sort of baked into the uh, informed consent uh, pie, uh, if you will. So biospecimens challenges that paradigm. You've got the biospecimens that may be acquired initially in a research context or may be acquired in a clinical context, and then they're sent off to a biobank. Somebody else is going to access those biospecimens and use them for research purposes that may not be may not have been anticipated at the time that those specimens were acquired. So what does that mean in terms of the informed consent process? How do we engage people properly to get their permission to use specimens in such a fashion? So it's that distance between the specimens and the original source of those specimens that creates this challenge around uh, knowledge and permission. In addition, there is no question a certain uh, public sensitivity about the personal nature of biospecimens. And the <clears throat> proposed research regulations actually make a fairly significant distinction between people's data and their biospecimens, with somewhat less uh, requirement, proposed requirements for um, permission around use of data. Now, I think a lot of us don't see that distinction, particularly because the data may well uh, uh, contain pretty highly sensitive information where it's quite uh, arguable whether you'll find anything of particular uh, uh, sensitivity in the analysis of the biospecimen. But yet there's this sense that this is a part of me uh, supported by the research where folks have a greater sensitivity about how biospecimens are managed compared to how their data uh, is managed. <clears throat> High scientific yield, this is a huge enterprise, the use of biospecimens, uh, particularly in this uh, era of uh, genetic research, have proven to be extraordinarily valuable for a whole host of reasons. And low risk, and I'm going to emphasize this uh, a little bit more here in a second. So the controversies focus, for the most part, on secondary uses of biospecimens originally obtained for other purposes. You have an opportunity to sit with a participant, you've got a protocol that you're going to be running and there's going to be a biobanking element or a tissue uh, analysis uh, part of that uh, protocol. You have the opportunity obviously to speak with folks about the use of their tissues and how that was going to play out in the context of research. So that's a regular informed consent sort of process. Got its own challenges that we'll talk about, but for the most part that's fairly straightforward. It's the issues that arise when that biospecimen is then put in a biobank and used for purposes for which perhaps the original uh, source didn't have a clear idea of what was going to be done because nobody had an idea of what might be done at that point. And then the secondary use of clinical specimens. People come into the hospital, they have tissue removed for one purpose or another that's used for its clinical purpose but then may, it is stored by pathology regulations but then may be accessed for research purposes. Here is where we have an even larger gulf between what people understand is going to happen with their biospecimens and what uh, uh, may actually happen uh, consistent with uh, how the regulations are structured. So it's these secondary uses I want to focus on primarily. <clears throat> so the risk. Here's my claim. There are really no instances of welfare harm uh, related to research with biospecimens. That's a pretty bold uh, statement. And we don't have, obviously, full coverage, full reporting system of uh, uh, the entire uh, field, but uh, in tracking this field pretty closely over the years, there simply are not instances in which there's been any significant breach of privacy or confidentiality or what I would call um, sort of tangible welfare harms. In other words, have people been injured in some concrete way by the conduct of this research? And I think the answer is, for the most part, no. But yet there's this whole second category of concerns that we need to be uh, sensitive to as well, what I've called dignitary harms here. In other words, people get upset when biospecimens are used <coughs> in ways that uh, they don't think are ethically justified. So there have been a number of cases where uh, this has been illustrated. They have a Supai uh, tribal case. Arizona State University had a project with the Havasupai Indians who live in the Grand Canyon. A small tribe, high incidence of diabetes, and uh, they acquired specimens after negotiation with the tribe to conduct uh, research uh, with diabetes. 
or at least as far as the tribe was concerned. The informed consent form had language that suggested that there may be a broader enterprise uh, with those biospecimens. Nevertheless, the tribe understood that this was the nature of the research. Well, lo and behold, the biospecimens were used for a variety of other projects in the future. Uh, one uh, related to uh, uh, mental health disease, <clears throat> and another that was particularly uh, interesting and problematic was uh, used for tracking the um, What's the right tune? Not evolutionary history, but uh, uh, the travels of, uh, where did the tribe come from originally? Fascinating domain of research that's been particularly prominent in recent years. So these investigators uh, found that, well, the, these uh, individuals were from uh, across the Bering Strait, Siberia. Well, interesting, but of course the tribe has its own explanation for where its people came from, and it wasn't from Siberia. So they were particularly upset that the Specimens had been used for a purpose that was contrary to the uh, interest of their group. So even though the individuals in the Havasupai tribe were de-identified, their notion was that the tribe itself was harmed by virtue of the secondary uses of these biospecimens. And this is a particularly problematic area because our uh, human subjects regulations don't look at group harms, they only look at individual harms. <clears throat> Won't go through each of these, but the Moore case in California, there was a fight over whether uh, Mr. Moore owned his specimens that uh, the investigator had acquired in the conduct of research and then turned into a fairly lucrative commercial product. And Mr. Moore said, so where's my cut of the pie? Um, this uh, resolution of that case is why we have within our consent forms now, consistently across the country, a line that says, we may develop a commercial product out of this research, and if we do, you don't get a piece of the pie, basically. <laughs> a little bit better uh, stated, but that's the notion. <clears throat> Henrietta Lacks case. How many folks have read the Henrietta Lacks book? Great. Strongly encouraged for everybody. Not because I think it's the best depiction of uh, uh, how the world is or perhaps should be, but um, fascinating discussion that's directly relevant here. She had uh, cervical cancer. That tissue was turned into uh, HeLa cells, uh, extraordinarily useful for an enormous range of research over uh, time. And uh, family, uh, and of course Henrietta Lacks herself, were not aware of these secondary uses. Uh, the book is a little unclear what the claim is, but there seem to be some justice issues. Should this family have benefited in some way from the enormous uh, enterprise that developed out of Henrietta's uh, cells? Newborn screening lawsuits I'm going to talk about here uh, in just a second as a particularly uh, uh, interesting and important domain that's raised these questions. So what are the federal regulations? If the individual source of a biospecimen is not readily identifiable to the investigator, the research is not considered human subjects research. If you don't know who you're dealing with, it's not human subjects. Now, of course, most of the time you're dealing directly with a person, and that's clearly human subjects research, but you can be dealing with their data or their biospecimens, and if you know who that person is, or that person can be readily identified, then it's human subjects research. But the uh, regulations were designed to say, if you don't know who that is, then that person cannot possibly be uh, uh, injured by virtue of that research, and therefore we're not gonna consider that human subjects research. Now, HIP is a little different. <clears throat> I would emphasize, though, that this readily identifiable standard, I mean, that's a pretty low standard. HIPAA is much more stringent with 18 identifiers, must be uh, removed to consider it de-identified. But the common rule standard in the federal regs, <clears throat> remarkably low, and despite that remarkably low standard, we haven't had instances of harm. So why is that? <clears throat> that's probably a much longer discussion, but I think my bottom line is, these things just aren't very valuable unless you've got a, a uh, subspecialty training to make use of those specimens in ways that can be uh, creative. You know, this is not, it's not Fort Knox. Biospecimen uh, bank is not Fort Knox. It's only valuable to people who have the expertise to use it. So identifiable specimens, if they are identifiable, <clears throat> then consent can often be waived if an IRB determines that the criteria are met. And I'll show you what those waiver criteria are. Uh, similarly, uh, consent can be simplified or altered if the research meets the waiver criteria. So a lot of choices for investigators and IRBs in this particular domain. De-identify them, then it's not human subjects research, or if it's identifiable, make the claim that you've met the criteria for waiver. <coughs> Excuse me, Here's the, here are the uh, 
waiver criteria. You have to fulfill all of these, and if you do, you can waive informed consent or simplify it. it has to be minimal risk. It will not uh, adversely affect the rights or welfare of the subjects. Nobody's quite sure what that one means. Not practicable to obtain consent. And when appropriate subjects are given pertinent information after participation. So <clears throat> it's really the uh, minimal risk and the not practicable that are the two key ones in this particular domain. And the general sense is if you've got 500 biospecimens that you've collected over a five or 10 year period of time, is it feasible to go back and talk to those people and get their permission for some future research project? Generally, the investigator in the IRB will agree that's just not practical. And you could try, but the burden to the research enterprise would be so great that it's not uh, um, appropriate to do so. So waivers are really pretty easy to get in this particular domain, again, if you're using identifiable samples. <clears throat> so here's a particular question. I'm framing down to this particular uh, debate, and this is where a lot of our own research has been uh, going forward in recent years. So is it ethically appropriate for state health departments to save residual blood spots after newborn screening for biomedical research purposes? How much should parents know about this practice and should parents be asked their permission? Okay, so one subset of this larger debate. So here's what happens across the uh, country at this point in terms of what state health departments do. So folks, I think this little, um, <clears throat> maybe outside your domain, so in this day and age, every baby that's born within the first few days gets a, a heel prick and uh, blood spots obtained. And more than 30 different conditions across the country then are um, uh, evaluated for early diagnosis and treatment as part of the newborn screening process. <clears throat> so there's almost always residual blood left over. So here's uh, what states do with those blood spots. This one, uh, if you can't read it, is one to six months. So that's pretty much long enough to do your clinical tests and then you don't save them after that. If you save them longer than six months, then chances are pretty good you're saving them for some other purpose. So you see increasingly long periods of time and you've got six states that save them indefinitely. And these are some of the largest states in the country, including California and New York. So a fairly large percentage of babies in the country have their blood spots saved for uh, decades. <coughs> So what do people use these things for? A variety of purposes. Probably the single most uh, common use is for quality assurance uh, purposes. Particularly the positive specimens are very valuable when you're trying to develop new uh, screening platforms to have true positives and true negatives, uh, extremely useful for that purpose. Forensic purposes, uh, um, rare, but uh, sometimes this is the only specimen left for a baby who's uh, died and you can match remains with uh, uh, the baby's original specimen, or sometimes you have a first child that dies, and maybe the explanation is uh, SIDS. Second child comes along with a heritable condition, and they say, ah, oh, maybe we missed the diagnosis that first time. Let's go back to that blood spot from that first baby, do an analysis, and find out whether, in fact, there was a, a heritable condition, perhaps, that was the explanation for that first death. Again, fortunately, those are rare. Biomedical research is the main one and the main controversial one. Genetic epidemiology, <clears throat> how common are certain variants within the population? Uh, Myriad uh, accessed uh, Utah's blood spots in a de-identified fashion back in the 1990s and asked the question, how often does BRCA1 uh, mutations occur within the Utah population? Pretty interesting. De-identified blood spots, but now uh, got an obvious ethical issue there. You've identified babies who have a BRCA1 mutation and a future risk of breast or ovarian cancer in a family that uh, presumably shares that variant. They identified so nobody pursued that, but um, interesting. Uh, illustrates the, that particular use. Uh, looking at metabolic disorders, endocrine disorders that are a focus of newborn screening, infectious diseases. Mothers and babies share the same environment. Um, the HIV epidemic is a good example of how these biospecimens were used early in the 1980s in New England to say, so. How many women are infected with HIV? <clears throat> you 
And what types of women are these? Are, is, are these urban populations? Are these suburban populations? And how is it developing over a period of time? You've got those blood spots saved. You can say, over the last five or 10 years, here's what we're seeing in terms of the incidence of HIV in the population. I suspect what we're gonna see within the next few years is that uh, these uh, blood spots are gonna be extremely useful for following uh, the Zika uh, infection in uh, pregnant women. Very useful for that, and also toxicology. Uh, again, uh, baby and mom share the same environment. You can measure toxins, potential toxins that are transferred uh, from the mother to the baby. Um, project uh, around the Great Lakes that looked at um, mercury in babies with mothers who lived next to the lake versus those who lived further away from the lake with the notion that if you live next to the lake, uh, chances are you're eating more fish. And as higher fish consumption lead to higher mercury exposure for babies. Uh, and indeed, that was found to be the case. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do with toxicology. So you can see how useful these things are. Um, we're currently doing a uh, literature review. We've identified so far 2,400 studies in the English literature using dried blood spots. And when we finish with this project, we'll have a, a breakdown of what those uses um, were over a period of time. So newborn screening dried blood spots. What do parents know about this? Nothing. Uh, and that's because newborn screening itself is conducted as part of a mandatory state program where parents are not asked their permission. There's some degree of notice and the ability for parents to opt out, but for the most part, folks don't know that they can opt out, so they don't do so. <clears throat> so newborn screening itself is conducted without parental permission, so uh, there's no vehicle by which folks are effectively uh, informed. Newborn screening brochures may have a sentence in here that says, uh, uh, the state may save these and use them, but um, when you've just had a baby, uh, are you reading all the brochures that are provided to you in the bottom of the bag? <coughs> uh, of course you're not. Not dissimilar, for example, for the admission agreement to the University of Utah that does have a line in there, whether it's 10 font or 11 font, but says we will uh, use or dispose of the residual samples in a manner consistent with state or federal law. Well, okay, we've informed our patients about what's gonna happen, right? <clears throat> Similarly, nobody reads that, nor if they were to read it, would they understand what that means. So research for dried blood spots is almost always conducted with de-identified spots, though. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's no longer human subjects research. Uh, many states do have the IRB look at it anyhow because it's a somewhat sensitive uh, domain. <clears throat> so here's what's happened. The public got wind of this and uh, made t-shirts. <laughs> Help, the government has my DNA. And that's how it was portrayed, of course. The government, the state, is developing a DNA biobank on the state population. And as you can imagine, uh, a lot of folks didn't think that was a very good idea. So two lawsuits were brought, both in 2009, <clears throat> both interesting on their own uh, um, bases. Minnesota's suit was based on a state genetic privacy law that said, if you're doing genetic testing, you need to get informed consent for the genetic test. Well, parents said newborn screening or uh, secondary research biospecimens, that's genetic. How come you didn't get our consent? Um, Court initially said, well, newborn screening is different, covered with a different set of laws, uh, but ultimately the public pressure was such that uh, uh, the <clears throat> complainants won that one. Texas was brought on a different basis, constitutional claim of illegal search and seizure. You're taking this stuff, you're seizing it, you're using it for purposes that I don't know about without my permission as a parent, uh, that's unconstitutional. Uh, the state hustled to solve this or uh, uh, resolve this out of court uh, because you can be sure that the state did not want the court to come forward and say secondary uses of biospecimens without permission is unconstitutional. <clears throat> we understand what an effect that would have on the research enterprise. Uh, <clears throat> so um, both these suits were pretty complicated, but for the most part, Texas ended up destroying five million samples that they had retained over uh, uh, a period of time. <clears throat> so what happened? Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. People have been waiting this, for this for a while. Federal legislation provides resources to help states with newborn screening in a variety of uh, different ways. So this was reauthorized in 2014. And literally, 
at the last minute, there was an additional provision 12 stuck into this law. And uh, I don't have, uh, I mean, it's common knowledge that this was uh, uh, Rand Paul, uh, who had uh, worked to insert this. <clears throat> and he's got a libertarian perspective, and this sort of reflects, to some extent, uh, the sensitivities of folks from a, from a more libertarian perspective. So research, it says, research with newborn screening dried blood spots is human subjects research whether or not the spots are de-identified. Okay, so this whole business about de-identifying and getting outside the regs is uh, no longer active. And waiver of parental consent for uh, research use is not permissible. So all the criteria to allow waiver are specifically um, invalidated with this law. So what does that mean? Any secondary uses for uh, residual biospecimens in this context needs to be conducted with uh, parental permission. And as I'll show you, that's pretty consistent with what the public wants, but I'll also tell you that this landed with a bombshell in the newborn screening world. Uh, it has simply arrested uh, research in this domain uh, because of the lack of infrastructure to get parental permission for these uh, uses. <clears throat> so, very difficult to implement a new consent provision because we're not getting consent for newborn screening itself. Uh, postpartum period is not the best time to, I mean, there's a lot of bad times in medicine to try to get consent. This is one of them. <laughs> postpartum period, short, hectic, other priorities. People are worried about other stuff, appropriately. Uh, the consent process is likely to result in a substantial decrease in available dried blood spots for research. So uh, Michigan now has a biotrust where they get informed consent for the acquisition of newborn screening uh, blood spots and secondary research units. Uh, research. Their uptake is just about 60%. California, when they made a transition in their newborn screening program to adopt uh, tandem mass spectroscopy as a uh, uh, infrastructure tool, um, was uh, required by the IRB to have an informed consent process. Their uptake was also about 60%. Now, is that because 40% of parents are saying no? It's not. It's because a large percentage of people aren't being asked the question. The staff in the nursery are too busy. It's not their thing. Research is not their thing. They've got clinical care to provide uh, the secondary consent process as an extra burden, an extra workload. And many individual nurses, many uh, units, and many whole hospitals said, we're not doing it. Now. If that 40% dropout is random in the population, then 60% you probably still have a good uh, uh, sample set. If it's not random and you have certain communities that have decided not to participate, then you've really lost the fundamental value of this specimen, which is that it's everybody, right? All geographic locations, uh, all racial and ethnic backgrounds, <clears throat> etc. So. This is uh, a serious problem at this point in this particular domain. So we're seeing this values conflict between our normal understanding that permission for research uses uh, is foundational and important. We're, but yet we see that that process so severely affects the research uh, enterprise and the infrastructure developed that it may invalidate the research that uh, uh, is being proposed. So how do we resolve that dilemma is sort of the key uh, issue. So in a similar vein, the notice of proposed rulemaking um, came out this last year. Comment period ended early this year and uh, the uh, Health and Human Services, the Office of Human Research Protection is working hard to try to get the final rule out by September of this year. So we may well see before the end of this year, changes in the federal regulations that have been in place for uh, 25, uh, 30 years or so. So this notice of proposed rulemaking, proposed to extend the definition of human subject to biospecimens, again, whether or not they're identifiable. Broad consent from individuals would be necessary before biospecimens could be used for research. And this is for specimens acquired prospectively, all the stuff we have in our bank wouldn't be uh, impacted. It would be prospective acquisition. Now, broad consent, what they mean is 
You asked folks some general questions. We're gonna, we would like to do research in the future with uh, your specimens. Uh, we don't know what kind of research that is. Is that okay with you? Now maybe it's a little bit less broad than that. Maybe if you're acquiring specimens in a Huntsman Cancer Institute, you would say we want to use it for cancer research. Maybe in this domain we would say we want to use it for uh, 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 investigating eye diseases. Um, but the notion is we don't know what we're going to use it for, so do we have your permission to use it for stuff? Uh, similarly, the criteria for waiver uh, would be quite limited under this proposal. So this too would change how we uh, approach this whole domain. And again, emphasize not so much an issue with the research context where you have an opportunity to ask folks, you know, can we use this stuff for other purposes in the future, but that cl the clinical context. And this would say that patients coming through your system would need to be asked their permission for secondary uses of biospecimens. And if you don't ask, if you don't have a, a documented yes, then those specimens are not available. So I want you to think about what the implications would be for the uh, research that's being done in your uh, domain. So here's my summary of the uh, uh, literature. Longer talk, we could walk through some of the studies, but uh, I have to trust me on, for the most part, study's been remarkably consistent here. The majority of individuals, when you talk to them about this, support secondary use of biospecimens. People get it. They say, I understand. I'm supportive of research. Uh, and particularly patient groups understand this. People want to know, but people want to know about it, right? Doing this stuff without any transparency is not acceptable to people. And people want a choice. Just ask me. <coughs> I'll say yes, but I want you to ask me. And what the literature also shows, if you ask them on an equal basis, okay, there's different ways we could ask you. One would be to say, we want your permission and we need you to sign this form in order for you to be in. Or you could have an opt-out system which says, here's how the system works. If you don't like it, let me know and you'll be out. And as you might guess, opt-in tends to have a substantially lower uptake than opt-out. <coughs> So there's a professional group, uh, Christine Grady, who runs the uh, bioethics program at the NIH, uh, put together a, a group of folks to look at this set of issues. <clears throat> I was part of that group, uh, but I didn't sign on to the final statement for reasons that I'll uh, illustrate for you in a second. But their question was, is this broad consent ethically appropriate? And their workshop participants in the statement they uh, published this uh, last year said the broad consent for research use is ethically permissible, permissible and in many cases optimal. When it includes the following components, initial broad consent, a good process of oversight and approval, and when feasible, ongoing process of providing information or communicating with donors. And I think this last one is particularly relevant to sort of smaller shop type of uh, circumstances. If you've got a particular clinic with a particular set of uh, patients who are coming through on a regular basis, uh, uh, then some sort of meaningful longitudinal communication is a little easier than uh, in other contexts. So this is what they had to say. They liked the notion of broad consent. So as I mentioned, the OHRP <clears throat> or the, the feds put forward this notice of proposed rulemaking. There always is a public comment period. So they got public comment and then they're going to publish the final rule later this year. Well, here's an analysis of the public comment as of a couple weeks ago. More than 2,400 comments received. That's a huge number. Anytime you propose federal regulations, you get a, a smattering of people who comment. This is enormous. People are very interested in this issue. So 2,400 with specifically on the biospecimen stuff. This was what folks were most concerned about in these proposed changes. <clears throat> Substantial majority of commenters oppose these proposals. And this is, what, this is how OHRP itself describes this. Most comments were from patients in the public. Opposition across all subgroups. Patients opposed it, the general public opposed it, and research affiliated organizations proposed it. Opposed it. Now what's interesting is they opposed it for different reasons. So it'll be very interesting to see how they uh, come forward. So here are the, here are the reasons. <coughs> what were the patients' concerns? Well patients, and I think what we mean by patients in this context is advocacy groups for patients with one disease or another didn't like this at all because they thought it would slow down research, which it will. They like the research enterprise. They understand that this is important for making progress with uh, uh, their disease. 
In contrast, the general public, and Rebecca Skloot, who wrote the Henrietta Lacks book, published a, an article in the New York Times before the end of the comment period that said, hello, folks, be aware that this is coming. If you're concerned, uh, write uh, the feds. And there was a wave of comment after that New York Times uh, article. Well, the general public was um, somewhat more supportive, even though the general public opposed it in general, but opposed broad consent and any waiver of consent. So their notion was, we want to know exactly what you're doing, and we don't think you should be able to waive consent. Talk to me. So completely opposite. And then research-affiliated uh, individuals overwhelmingly opposed, and really on the basis of several arguments. Enormous complexity of the tracking decisions. And we tried to think this through, certainly from the University of Utah over the last couple of years. How would you set up a process where you would have a database that would track every patient that came through the institution and what their choice is? <laughs> Understanding that a lot of people come in multiple times, and they may well change their mind or not sign the form this time when they signed it a month ago. Uh, and if you don't sign the form, then you're out. So extremely complicated tracking mechanism, very expensive. Lack of risk of uh, biospecimen research. We're not talking about stuff that's dangerous. And really, this is a central ethical concern, the lack of a meaningful consent for, versus broad consent. Now, particularly if you're offering this to everybody who walks through the institution, uh, it will quickly collapse into what uh, a lot of us uh, perceive the HIPAA process to be, right? Sign, sign these forms, and the doctor will see you, uh, you know, in, in 20 minutes or so. Nobody reads this stuff, nobody understands it, but you get a signature. And what the federal, proposed federal regulation said, once you get that signature, you don't have to have any sort of IRB oversight. There's no IRB, there's no oversight left at all. You can do whatever you want with those, literally whatever you want with those specimens. So, the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research uh, Protections is an uh, advisory committee to the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, about the whole range of uh, human subject protection legislation. Uh, I currently chair this, so I had the opportunity to um, work with the group to prepare the statement on the NPRM. We oppose the proposals regarding biospecimens for, these, for this reason. Subjects would not be sufficiently informed to make a knowledgeable and educated decision about participation in undefined future research. While researchers would rely on a vague, broad consent to conduct unfettered, unsupervised, and unlimited future research on subjects, biospecimens, and data. So one might expect, we said, therefore, that broad consent would be less a commitment to individual autonomy than a license to researchers for unfettered use. So here's the challenge, and I'm going to take a step back uh, here um, for a minute to uh, talk about informed consent in general and how we might approach this uh, issue. So you have full informed consent with the form up here. This is the sort of uh, ideal maximal uh, engagement. You could have broad consent, so less specific information with the form. You could have a simplified consent form a simplified consent process with or without a form, and then all the way down here you got waiver of informed consent, which of course isn't, what, isn't informed consent at all, it's uh, nothing. <clears throat> so here's the domain that I'm interested in thinking about. Do we have an opportunity to think about other ways to address this issue in that particular context? <laughs> so let's talk about informed consent, and specifically the issue of uh, comprehension. It's intrinsically difficult. When I came to SACARP uh, uh, as chair now four years ago, this it was going to be my mission to try to improve the informed consent process because everybody recognizes that it's seriously problematic. People call it broken. And I think that's a, not an unfair. Um, but it turns out it's actually very hard. People have very poor scientific literacy, the general public I'm talking about. They don't know about biomedical subjects. Highly variable literacy in general and highly variable numeracy. Numeracy, of course, being how people understand numbers. You say something simple like 10% of people might have this adverse, you know, 10%. People don't understand what that means. A lot of people don't. Content's difficult for investigators to simplify. Uh, it's part of our acculturation process to lose the ability to uh, frequently talk in normal people speak. And uh, it's much easier with your consent form to kind of take the language from the proposal and kind of plunk it into the consent form, and uh, you're good to go. 
Forms are crafted with limited attention to comprehension. It's not a priority. Uh, long, high reading levels, dense, limited use of graphics. These are all how our consent forms are structured, uh, and the IRBs do not uh, push back and force people to, to use what we do know. So what, what do we know? And I'm going to show you that in a second. <clears throat> so I think there's few incentives for any of the stakeholders to improve comprehension. Uh, other than the research participants themselves, which of course are a pretty key stakeholder, but um, the claim here is that sponsors, investigators, IRBs, all gain benefits and avoid burdens through high complexity. There's simply no effective pressure within this system. And part of that is the fact that my efforts with SACCARP to try to make a significant change here have uh, failed. And part of, the, part of that failure, uh, to some extent, is this pushback, but it's also the current regulations actually don't require people to be able to understand. They require you to say stuff to folks. They don't require that they understand what you've said. <clears throat> and so there's no hook. You put out a 40-page consent form at a graduate school level, there's no way the feds could come in and say, we're going to cite you for noncompliance because you've got a lousy consent form. There's simply no hook to do that. Now the new proposed regulations have one line in there that says consent process will be done in a fashion that is understandable to research participants. So that one line is going to be a hook, uh, uh, I hope, for and actually enables forcing some change uh, down the road. But here's one of the hooks. Despite extensive evidence that research participants often have a very limited understanding of key elements of research, people agree to participate anyhow. All right, so this problem with comprehension would have been solved a long time ago if folks were of the mode to say, I don't have no idea what you just said. I don't understand what this research is about. Why would I sign up with you? They don't say that. They don't understand, but they sign anyhow, right? So we allow research to go forward with a, a, often a modest level of uh, uh, understanding. So what have we learned over the years? <clears throat> There's been some good research, although not enough. Revising forms for simplicity and processability and graphic presentation does show some efficacy. It's not revolutionary, but it helps. Use of multimedia tools is promising, but also not dramatic. Teachback and one-on-one -on -one discussions are promising. So teachback is where you say, I'm, I want to understand whether I was communicating effectively with you. Can you, under, can you tell me what you understand to be the, the risks of this uh, research participation? Or tell me what you understand the purpose of this research. And if they don't get it right, then you uh, readdress the problem until they understand. So this is good. Therapeutic misconception, I, I won't talk about, uh, uh, but it's a serious concern. This is where people misconstrue research uh, intentions for clinical intentions. They think they're allocated to one research group or another because that's what their doctor think is best for them as a person. But really the whole issue is why people agree is for trust. And that's true probably both sort of in general clinical realm, trust is central, but also in the research realm. If they trust you as an investigator, if they trust um, University of Utah, uh, Moran Eye Center, then they're likely to agree whether or not they have a real understanding of what the uh, enterprise is about. So that's a good thing to a certain extent. Uh, it's, a, it's not a good thing if, uh, in fact, you don't deserve that trust. So obviously, it's incumbent upon us to deserve the trust that people place in us. So um, what should be the nature of the informed consent for the clinical context for secondary biospecimen use? So again, I'm interested in this issue of what we do with people who are coming through for clinical care and we're going to use their specimens for secondary use. Uh, if we want to get consent for that, it's a large new commitment of time. And who's going to do this? You know, people at the front desk, are they the right people to engage in this conversation? Uh, you got to have knowledgeable staff. It's really a low priority. People are concerned about their health. They're coming in here for other reasons. This is not a priority uh, either for the clinicians or the patients. Need for large investment in tracking database and a complete lack of risk. So given these uh, facts or at least perceptions of reality, uh, what's justified? What should we be doing uh, here? So informed consent, obviously a foundational uh, principle. Uh, first one in the Nuremberg Code, part of the Belmont Report and Respect for Persons. And what Faden and Beecham has said is we need to be thinking about consent as intentional, with understanding, and without controlling uh, influences. But what if this autonomous authorization 
is really not a realistic goal. Can we define more limited goals that permit research when fully autonomous authorization can't be achieved? That particularly from a full understanding standpoint. Are there different ways to think about our obligations to sources of biospecimens? So uh, here I'm going to rely on an interesting proposal or set of ideas by uh, Frank Mellon and Alan Wertheimer um, that they articulated a couple years ago. It's called the Fair Transaction Model. And what they say is the criteria for assessing the validity of consent transactions should be based on fair terms of cooperation for the respective parties that reflect the context of the activity. So they want to focus on both sides of that agreement, not just how much do people understand, but what's fair in terms of uh, uh, both sides of the agreement. What fairness entails, they say, will vary reasonably depending on the risk benefit pro profiles presented in the clinical trial. So if you're doing chemotherapy, if you've got a phase one chemotherapy trial, well, you better have high expectations for understanding of, uh, uh, for the individuals because they're making a, a very serious and potentially life-threatening commitment. On the other hand, minimal risk research uh, uh, accordingly uh, would impact the, what your obligations are. For low risk transactions, the example, they use the example of signing forms for mortgages and car rentals and software purchases. I mean, how many times a day or a week do you click through a consent agreement, right? You check into a hotel in order to get online, you click through their agreement. Anybody ever read one of those? No. Why is that okay? And would it be reasonable for me at a, at a new hotel to call down to the front desk and say, I'd like somebody to come up here and explain this consent form <laughs> for me. And uh, I want to understand what the risks and benefits are of my uh, uh, joining your uh, system, right? Nobody expects that to happen. And nobody's built the infrastructure to do that. But yet somehow we feel OK about that. Why is that OK? Now, legitimately, you might say, somebody really ought to be writing this in ways that I could understand it if I wanted to. But uh, for the most part, we feel OK about checking through those things. And what they claim is that, indeed, that is a legitimate transaction. But it's heavily dependent on institutional protections uh, that justify these agreements to begin with. I mean, I feel OK about clicking there, because I don't really think this is a high risk enterprise because I have a certain amount of trust that there's been checks and balances elsewhere in the system that are protecting me. So in this particular context, it seems to allow for a limited disclosure of information when the risks are low, institutional protections are in place. It seems to allow for a limit or no assessment of whether people actually understand what they're signing up for. Secondary research biospecimens, extremely low risk, low burden for the sources, and good institutional protections in place, high scientific value, highly burdensome system to actually obtain fully autonomous authorization. If you could do it, it would take an enormous uh, uh, enterprise. So the conclusion would be a modest level of authorization acceptable, no assessment <coughs> of comprehension is probably accessible, but a complete lack of transparency is not. And I think where we as an institution, and I'm thinking broadly uh, of not only University of Utah, but really all of uh, the biomedical enterprise, we don't, let, we don't tell folks what's going on. They have very little opportunity to sort of understand what happens with their biospecimens uh, or data, et cetera. So there's been almost a complete lack of transparency there. I think where, again, this proposal is going to go uh, into that space. Here's what Sakhar proposed with relate, related to biospecimens. We recommended a requirement for provision of notice of research practices. Let folks know what you're doing with an opt-out mechanism. No signature required. Um, allow people to exercise their opt-out rights. I mean, it can't be some Byzantine uh, telephone system uh, that works on Tuesday mornings to allow people to opt out. You have to give them some legitimate level of choice. And you track people who opt out. You don't have to track everybody. You track that small percentage of people who are concerned, who do care, who ask some questions and say, this isn't for me. Fine. Uh, and you're not gonna, we're not going to waive that uh, opt out. And if they've opt out, they're opted out. So it still requires fair uh, investment in institutional tracking, but uh, at least theoretically far less than an opt in. So I think the notice and opt out approach promotes transparency and choice 
But the ethical justification is contingent upon uh, a real effort to do this in the right way. The problem with notice and opt out is that you can put it in a brochure, right, that sits on the clerk's desk and say, okay, we're done. We told people when in fact you haven't. So you really need to make a legitimate effort to, to try to help folks to understand. <clears throat> I think this approach is appropriately calibrated to the level of risk and the challenges of uh, actually uh, obtaining a fully autonomous authorization here. So we did a focus group a couple years ago, a series of focus groups around the West here, uh, specifically on this issue. Uh, the university was thinking at the time, and still is, about how to approach this issue. So we did 12 focus groups, which is pretty robust for a focus group study. We told them what happens in this day and age with respect to access to their records for research purposes and what happens to secondary biospecimens. And of course, folks had no idea. It's like, well, I, you know, I thought my record was in a chart in my doctor's office. And I thought they, well, I, I didn't know what they did with the specimens. I kind of sort of thought they destroyed them after they used them. So you tell folks this stuff and it's like, wow, okay, that's a big deal. But you also tell them, you know, what's been the national experience in terms of risks and also that there's uh, institutional safeguards in place. And this notion that, you know, if you have a research project, you have to go to this group called the IRB in order to make sure that that research is being conducted ethically. And folks say, well, that's a pretty good idea. I, li that's a good, I like that. That's reassuring when folks learn that kind of stuff, which they, of course, don't know. So large majority of participants supported this uh, opt-out. We said, uh, here's what we're thinking about. So we phrased it a little bit differently. We didn't say, you know, all other things being equal, would you prefer opt-in and opt-out? We said, we'd like to do the notice and opt-out approach. Would that be acceptable for you as a uh, user of the system? And folks said, yeah, as long as you tell me, as long as I have a choice, that's fine. Seem to be, fro oh, here we go. So, conclusions. Consent with biospecimens represents really a, a important and interesting and truly problematic conflict in values. We do want to respect people's autonomous making decision. We know people do care about this, or many people do. But yeah, we also want research to go forward. It's a legitimate clash in those values. Bates relevant to other contexts uh, where we're using stuff away from the bedside. Data, not much difference with data and biospecimens, but there's big data studies, cluster randomized trials, a lot of interesting areas where it's very difficult to get individual consent. <clears throat> I think notice and opt out may be inappropriate when the risks are low and institutional safeguards are in place. Uh, but we need more innovative ideas. We need more research in this uh, domain. We need to figure out how better to, to, to do what we really want to do, which is make sure folks are uh, adequately uh, making decisions about uh, this aspect of their health care. All right, I'm going to stop there, so thank you. <clears throat> slides ahead of time and there's you know some things that we thought of and obviously we're interested in what other people thought I think from your presentation and I think one of the interest more interesting discussions is for me personally is the question of sort of the opt-in versus opt-out uh, consent process and um, mostly because I I certainly have a concern with the opt-out that like you said there's got to be mechanisms in place to make sure that that's actually effectively done, and I think in a lot of places that would maybe be ineffectively done, which I think you know some people may have a concern with. Um, but I think you're right, if you, if you have an opt-in policy, it's harder to track. Um, so I'd be interested to see you know, potentially what discussion points may come from that. The other thing that, you know, thinking about sort of bioethics and sort of different things related to it, there's sort of the four cornerstones that we always talk about, which is autonomy, justice, beneficence, non maleficence And I think you raised a very good point that most of the biospecimens research, there hasn't been really 
uh, individual non-maleficence that's been shown. I think the question most interesting to me is this concept of autonomy. And you know, if you have de-identified data, is that then considered you know, not to be human research, uh, research and so thus you don't really have autonomy, autonomy concerns because it's no longer a person's um, actual uh, specimen. So I'd be curious about Dr. Jacobson's uh, discussions about that as well. I don't know if you had anything else. Yeah, so we were just hoping to kind of, Russell and I, our role is just to present a few of the issues that we thought of, and then uh, and then Dr. Jacobson's going to help kind of facilitate a discussion the way he does so well. Um, and so th those were a couple points that Russell had thought of. Uh, Dr. Olson, did you have something? So uh, another important consideration here is uh, the needs of the general society. And uh, a case in point was just recently published, and, and uh, these are people who have gone through very broad databases to try to find out individuals who have clear genetic risk, either dominant or they are uh, you know, both side recessive, dual recessive, where essentially there should be 100% incident of the disease and have no clinical disease ever. And uh, they have come up with these. They're, they're calling them superhuman. Yeah. They're super people. Because, and uh, uh, they have found that there are these people out there clearly should have awful diseases, and, and the, all the evidence they have, they, and they should have had it by the time that they gathered the blood, but it's all de-identified, and now they can't go back and find those people. And these people, I think, are incredibly valuable, and they're, they're tearing their hair out. They said that from hundreds and hundreds of thousands of specimens, and here society uh, you know, have, has, a, uh, has also a need in association with, if, if, you know, now we can't easily go back and find out what these people have that potentially could be a treatment for these awful things. That's really interesting. And it just barely come out. It, just, it was actually yeah. listed in just last week's uh, uh, Economist about, about uh, uh, this effort, and that's the biggest single thing that society would have think would be a very exciting work. So there is a society, a societal side to this, that, that also loses out that has an interest. And that kind of goes along with, I thought one of the interesting things from your presentation was that the the group that was really in support of, that was disagreed with the proposed regulations because they wanted fewer regulations were the patients who right. <clears throat> want more research, research to be easier. And I, I thought that was really interesting and kind of highlights that we can benefit from, from the research. Well, we found this in our own research. Uh, with respect to the blood spot uh, uh, issue, we did a, a large national survey of just general public attitudes. And uh, again, a lot of folks were very supportive, but they wanted to know about it and wanted a choice. <clears throat> we then took a second, much smaller group of parents, kids with uh, parents of kids who had had leukemia and parents of kids with PKU, uh, one of the conditions, of course, on the newborn screening panel, and asked them the very same set of questions. And as you might guess, uh, they were much more supportive of uh, research. The first group was supportive. This group really got it. And so once you've had a disease experience in the family, then your attitudes change. But uh, that group actually had uh, pretty much the same group of uh, attitudes about information and choice and uh, privacy protections as well. So <coughs> that piece seems to be uh, a core interest. <coughs> Dr. Morris? Yeah, I'd like to hear Dr. Botkin's uh, comment about uh, Dr. Olson's uh, uh, recognition of the community need. Yeah. Ruth Faden and her colleagues have written recently uh, and uh, claimed that it's not fair for people in the community to be freeloaders. Uh, in other words, to participate in the reception of the benefits of medical research, but not to contribute to medical research, to freeload because their, their uh, neighbors in the community have participated in research. We've learned better how to manage patients. They now benefit from that new information, but they're not uh, they're not engaged. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, directly linked to yeah. Dr. Olson's comment about the community obligation. Well, uh, there are, um, I wouldn't say a strong uh, theme of communitarian philosophy uh, out there within the U.S. Uh, system, but that's uh, uh, an entirely leg legitimate approach, and some of the members of our uh, SACARP committee wanted to very much push that, exactly that notion. All of us have benefited from people's contributions to the research enterprise in the past. If you're coming to an institution like this, you're benefiting from what those folks 
uh, did. It's your obligation to contribute to that enterprise in some way that uh, if the risks are in fact very small. I mean, you don't have a big obligation to put yourself at risk, but if in fact the risks are extremely small and there's good safeguards in place, you have an ethical obligation to contribute to that, and therefore we're gonna take advantage of that obligation and not necessarily talk to you about it or ask you about it. So the question is whether that, uh, I think, can be ethically justified, but it doesn't fly very well with the general public. The general public doesn't so much say, they don't get that piece. They do want to know about it, and they do want uh, uh, some choice about it. So I think that that's a, it would be an uphill climb over time to try to reestablish the research regulations on a more um, communitarian basis. And I would say that there's a bit of a black history that we're working against, too. Not too many years ago, the notion was, well, you're a charity patient at our institution. Uh, you're going to pay us back by being a research participant. And we're not going to tell you about it, uh, uh, but we may well uh, apply substantial risks. I mean, that was common terminology in the 50s, uh, even into the 60s. So we've got to be guard against that sort of abuse of that philosophy as well. <clears throat> Jay? Yeah. Maybe Yes, with my add a chair and be available for commenting and questions, and I'll try to sort of yeah. drive those. Um, let me just pop up here for a minute and say, I, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Jeff and say what a, a lovely job that was, covering both a very long and complicated um, ethical and legal history. Uh, we both have a colleague, Peggy Batten, a philosopher, who reminds us that what we call hard cases in ethics often are cases where there's one ethical theory that drives one conclusion and another valid ethical theory which goes in exactly the opposite direction. And I think that um, Randy's question and Alan's follow-up kind of remind us that two very big theories about what is right are in conflict here. The first one is very, very American. This idea about autonomous choice is a principle-based theory with huge weight on the principle of autonomy. So a way to think about what Jeff talked about is to think about how this looks, for example, across cultures. Not all cultures value autonomy or that principle as much as we do. And we'll ask him to talk a little bit about that in other places. The other one is to think about the, the ethical theory called utility or utilitarianism which gets a little closer, I think, to the idea of weighting the community's interest, what's best for the most, as opposed to what does one individual choose, where choice is so important. And I think when you think about the scientific enterprise, we tend to lean toward that utilitarian approach, right? The things that we're looking at, many of us are clinicians, but on the research side, our goal, I think, is to improve things for large, numbers of people, and we think about the results of our research that way, that is, the research that makes a difference for a large number of people tends to be more exciting and more compelling than something that might affect a single individual. So as soon as we begin to weight the consequences to the many, think about the topic that Jeff is talking about. That is, if you look at risk-benefit, which a utilitarian would do, add up the harms and add up the goods, as he concluded, it's really hard to find any individual harm from research on things like blood spots or retained specimens. On the other hand, if you look at the collective benefit, it gets bigger and bigger over time. It's almost unbounded, that is, we can't fully describe it. But a utilitarian would measure real consequences that are observable, and the weight tilts tremendously. Uh, for the general benefit being so much greater than the individual harm. I mean, it's not even close. So you have to really look at what the claim is for harm. And the claim, I think, rests around that tremendous value in our country of autonomy and individual choice. And another one, which is kind of a more recent value, which is this idea of privacy, right? A constructed value. It's not a constitutionally named principle but Americans care a lot. That little t-shirt tells a really big story. The last thing that I wanted to say is that I mentioned looking broadly, how does this look in other cultures? The other one is over time. And I think that, and again, Jeff mentioned on one of his slides that lack of trust or having trust in a body is a critical element. 
Many of you, I think, can appreciate that in our lifetime, we've seen a huge erosion of trust in institutions and particularly the government. So I think you just want to recall some of the things that kind of government does that went un unresisted for so long. For example, a draft, right? Where there's no opt out. There's a government choice to take not just your tissues, but your whole life and put those at risk. And the counter argument is for the benefit of the larger society. So there's an argument where you have government control of much more than a blood spot, right? But we haven't seen that for a very long time. Yeah. And I would gamble that there would be more resistance to that in the 21st century than there was in the 19th or the 20th. So I think those are really important background issues. I see this issue as a very American issue and the, the argument about insufficient trust in government. That is, when you talk about the child's DNA, isn't that interesting? The government also has the child's birth certificate. As in terms of data, we do know who that child is, right? And there's often a fingerprint on the birth certificate. So we actually have a lot of identifiable data that people haven't focused on but I think that the kind of confrontation between genetic technology, which is very confused in people's minds in terms of what it identifies, and this idea of government distrust has really kind of combined to make what in many places I will argue would be a trivial issue. That is, I think there are many cultures that would have no controversy over the goodness of taking specimens that are de-identified and learning things about the public. But those are just kind of across and vertical ways of looking at this problem. Jeff, what about that across cultures? You have colleagues internationally. How does this look in other countries? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And I think that there, the fact that uh, the biomedical world is uh, in such close communication, we all publish in the same journals, a lot of dialogue, that there's probably not as dis as large a distinct differences in other cultures as you might guess on this particular issue. I do think the dialogue's different and where I think other countries have probably done a better job than we have done or probably could do is with the engagement of the community. In other words, the notion might be, so how do the English people think about this particular enterprise? And I think sort of crafting um, ways to go forward that are consistent with what that feedback is, is a more comfortable way within those societies to say, uh, We've done due diligence, we understand what the public has to say, and now we're crafting this uh, national policy accordingly. Here, it's a much more balkanized or atomized sort of system where you would have to engage your local community. And you have to pay attention to those small number of voices in the community that might really have something different to say. So I think here, we're more sensitive to making sure that there's individual choice, even for those folks who are, tend to be somewhat outliers on their particular uh, point of view. So uh, Vanderbilt would be a good uh, example, um, they did a wonderful job with their bio view um, that uh, engaged the community over a period of time in a very robust way and uh, acquired community feedback. They have a very high stature within the community and they set up a system that was a notice and opt out uh, that functioned uh, uh, quite well with very high levels of uh, engagement. So they took seriously that sort of community engagement the way I think uh, a lot of the Europeans have done. Uh, interestingly though, I think the Europeans um, probably have a higher degree of concern over some of the privacy issues than a lot of the U.S. folks do. For some reason, the privacy issues have been um, very uh, uh, prominent in that um, particular domain and have uh, uh, restricted some of the uh, uh, otherwise communitarian sort of philosophy that may be part of those societies more generally. Sorry. I just want to ask the residents <coughs> from your background want to make any other comments on these issues? Yeah, I just had kind of one question and just observation. And that's, I, I felt like throughout your presentation, you talked about how the, the general public actually really has kind of a similar opinion for it. And I got the sense that that didn't really vary so much by, yeah, you, you might guess that it would vary by um, political background or ideological background, but it, it sounded almost like the public is pretty much in consensus that they want to know and that, and that they want to be informed. 
they need informed consent and all of that. Is, it, is that your observation or does it kind of vary? Well, actually one of the interesting things we did with our large public survey, 3,800 folks across the country on the newborn screening blood spots, uh, we worked with our uh, political science department here at the university and got measures of political uh, background, religious background, of course we had race, income, that sort of uh, background as well. And probably the single biggest predictor, well it was the single biggest predictor of concern about um, the uh, access to blood spots was a conservative political philosophy. So um, those sorts of things are relevant. We did not find that race or income or education level ended up having much of an impact. It was really political philosophy that ended up having the most uh, significant impact. So you're right. A lot of times when we talk about, you know, overall 80% of people think this is a good idea, well, you break down that um, 80% and the 20%, and those are different people uh, in ways that you can sometimes describe. One of the things that I think is so interesting is that if you don't ask, you don't know, and if you do ask, you can't always predict what you're going to learn. A relevant connection to this, I think, is if you think about garbage. So we know the computer language of garbage in, garbage out, right? A lot of us, I think, might think about specimens that are harvested from patients as garbage. That is, they, they've let go of them. I think the blood spot is not a bad example. That is, if the sheet was soiled, right, with a drop of blood, you'd throw that away. And nobody actually asks questions about the drop of blood on the sheet. So I think a lot of this actually could be modeled that way and it looks really differently, but watch what happens. If you were to ask people, can we investigate your garbage? Can we look through your garbage for things that might prove valuable? Many of you must know that there are archeologists who actually do this. <laughs> and, and it's a fascinating yeah. model because what they find often by large communities is very useful information about people's behavior, right? So if you went to people and said, we're going to use your garbage to do something that would be very valuable in the long run to the community, how do you feel about that? I will speculate that in America you find a significant number of people who would say, I'd really like to know who's looking through my garbage. And Jeff didn't talk about money very much in his presentation, but you want to remember in the background, particularly the Moore case, when somebody's making a lot of money off something that you discarded that has no personal use to you, at least again I'll speculate, a lot of people in America would like a part of that. Yeah. So I think the garbage story is a really interesting one to look at, and here are just a couple things, because common law has to deal with all of these things garbage and blood specimens or tissue specimens. So, somebody finds a ring in your garbage. Is it theirs? So, just kind of think about that for a little while. What the courts have done is just fascinating. That is, the details are always <coughs> important. Well, if you threw away the ring, you were angry. <laughs> this is a marital discord and a ring hit the garbage, right? You threw it away it pretty much belongs to the finder, right? As soon as you say it was an accident, or I didn't know that you know, it was gonna wind up in the garbage, there's at least a debate. And that goes on, and it wouldn't matter if it was de-identified. That is, if the finder melted it down, I think there still would be a fight. So the fact that it's not identifiable as your ring, probably less important. The key is around value and who owns what. There are actually some famous cases about garbage where a movie script was thrown away. And the person who discovered it knew they had something really valuable here. And an argument ensued. Eventually, this showed up in law. And it was decided that it was in the garbage, not because the owner of the script threw it away, but someone who wasn't authorized to do that with the script did so. So that became relevant. So just kind of going back to the idea of consent, um, European countries and other countries have dealt with organ donation. You want to think about that. It's very much like tissue. It's organized tissue, right? And so there are places that have this opt-out phenomenon that Jeff is talking about where the greater good is an argument over things like autonomy and choice. That is, so many people could benefit from the organs that are available at your death that people have made the choice of saying, let's assume 
that people have agreed to do that. Ours is quite opposite. Yeah. And again, it's a very relevant analogy. That is now the source of the tissue is dead. But we still fight about the idea of autonomy, even as a surrogate. So even in this country where people have decided to donate their organs, when family members are resistant to that, more often than not, we acknowledge it. Right. Now let's hear some of your questions. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's really important what you were saying about um, education and community engagement. And I think that people do want to see <coughs> research um, done. Um, I think it's really difficult, this is even coming from some of my own personal experience, um, organ donation, um, to, to, you know, <coughs> opt in or in, to opt in or out during a really stressful hospital setting. I think it'd be amazing, um, this, a little bit sounds to me a little strange, but if we could educate people more, even like in high school biology classes, have a little bit of a blurb or a little bit of a uh, time where kids study about <coughs> research and learn about, you know, issues, ethical issues um, about tissue donation. And I think it would be amazing, I know they tr with organ donation being tied in with driver's licenses, if people could be educated and maybe given a, a chance to opt in and out not to just organ donation, but tissue usage with like a driver's Good. license, um, have that opportunity. And you know, now, you know, if you're checking into a hospital, you would be able to show or scan in the future your driver's license and say what your individual wishes are. Something like that could be done. I think the public wants to be educated and maybe something like that in the future could be done. I yeah, I think great comment. And um, I think one of the things we have to get over first is our own reluctance to talk about research. And I think as an academic institution, we're often don't really want to highlight that because it does make some people nervous. And, and parents may not want that in an education setting, but I think it would be great if kids learned more about that in like a high school biology class. Well, I agree entirely. And it was nice to see as I came up the elevator from the parking lot this morning, you got a big billboard down by the elevator that highlights research. I mean, so we have to do that piece of it, but I also think there's lots of creative uh, uh, ways using new technologies that we can engage folks that don't involve, you know, a nurse sitting down with the patient in the hospital to yeah. let me tell you it's, about this. It's very, very difficult. My um, first husband passed away, and I was a medical, mm -hmm. um, medical a resident at the time. And um, I was with my mother-in-law, and nobody asked me about do I want to donate <clears throat> this tissue. And I honestly have regretted it to this time. I, I was too scared to say, you know, why isn't anybody asking me? I'd like to yeah. donate the tissue. Nobody asked me, and I was in that setting too afraid to bring it up. Let me collect several comments. We'll bank them and then we'll get to the, the re responses. Yes, over here. I think your hand was up for a while and then over there. Yes. So quick um, question maybe sort of bringing it down into the world we live in. So you mentioned garbage. So we refer to cataract surgery where we take out the cataract surgery with surgical waste. Mm -hmm. And on our consent forms, we actually have one little line that says, you know, in agreeing to have cataract surgery, you are agreeing to having anything removed from your eye that would otherwise be discarded that you give us permission to use. Should we be rethinking this? I mean, right now we collect it as we identify, and we don't think of it really as bio specimens, we think of it as surgical waste. And just with this whole conversation, how does it affect us? How should we be thinking? But that's a great example. Let's bank that question, and I think the residents' comment would be helpful too, and maybe others in the audience to respond. Yes. So, Dr. Botkin, I was very interested in uh, in your focus groups. Did you uh, were you able to get a sense of the literacy level on, on science, on scientific methods of your participants? Like, in other words, did people have an understanding that science is exploratory, and sometimes in the future we really it's hard for us to say. We're going to use it for this because we haven't discovered that this yeah. is important. And how that might differ from like policy or what politicians might be using sound bites, and yet a lot of what is said, there's still uncertainty, but somehow it's more, it seems that more uh, credibility is placed into someone who sounds confident about this. I'm going to, I'm going to be able to stop poverty for example, or something like that, as opposed to science, which tend to say, well, we don't know, we're going to explore. Well, let me, again, let me hold on to that one, and it's a question about kind of their <coughs> literacy and comprehension and how things are presented, yeah. So since our residents travel with us overseas to operate with some patients, I wonder if you keep an open mind here. American exceptionalism has been discussed much in 
that request is made. Medical exceptionalism is something we should be acutely aware of. As you know recently, Pfizer was taken to task for carrying out experiments collecting specimens in Nigeria, which they couldn't do over here. What gives us, you, a right to do that internationally when you can't do it locally? I want residents to remember the same question because it's taken strong concerns from some of the original cabinets in Nepal, Nigeria, Iran, etc. The same principles should apply because you apply it locally. And I do take exception to this that Americans have a high standard of personal independence, whereas other cultures don't. I'm sorry. That's not the case. We travel internationally these days. Every culture has a very high standard of personal responsibility. I like that comment about community responsibility. You can't just have the latest drugs because they were developed in Nigeria and Ghana and use them in England or America. I think you have to. And this is where we must inculcate from when children are very young the principle of supporting the community at all times especially when you have minimal damage, collecting a blood spot, <coughs> there's really no risk to you whatsoever. And I think we sometimes navel gaze and continue to create problems which we shouldn't. And we say, I'm sorry, this is of no, this is, it's unlikely to cause any harm to anybody. And you have to draw the line somewhere and say, there's only so much permission you can ask when there is absolutely no risk. And I think that will generate more of a supportive structure let me take one more question if there is one and we'll get panel responses. Fine. Let's go ahead and do that. I want to start with um, any, uh, the question about trust and presentation, and we'll go to the cataracts that are harvested. Jim, uh, what else did you learn from the focus groups? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things. So I'll take that uh, sort of question first. Uh, I would say we had some members of the focus group with some healthcare background, and they had a pretty good understanding of how the system works. Folks without a healthcare background had zero understanding, really, of some basic uh, issues. And so part of what we did with this study was uh, work with the Genetic Science Learning Center, developed a 12-minute movie that actually talked about, illustrated, animated ways in which data are used and distributed in the research enterprise so that we tried to get everybody up to a some minimal level of understanding about how the system works. So we've, we've used that in a number of different circumstances and found that to be very useful for uh, healthcare. So folks were, on the one hand, surprised and concerned that these things were going on, but on the other hand, uh, reassured, because people's understanding of research probably is largely dominated by you know, bubbling beakers in the basement sort of uh, uh, phenomenon, and to understand that uh, we take the oversight seriously was very uh, helpful. Uh, in terms of the international angle, uh, basically the regulations at least require um, us not to function at levels that are below U.S. requirements uh, in international circumstances, but does also require engagement with uh, local communities to honor their uh, sensibilities and approach to uh, the conduct of ethical research. So decision making and consent differs in some societies with how uh, permission is granted. and so. Uh, it, it should be designed to be uh, sensitive to the local community in that regard. But uh, no question there's ongoing concerns about um, sort of not exactly biopiracy, but going, other, going elsewhere, uh, applying different standards, and then utilizing that for the benefit of our society and not returning any of those benefits to the community where the research was conducted. So I wonder if I could start with the residents with your question. Do you know what the fate is? of the cataract material that is harvested from patients, and what sense do you have about what information patients um, comprehend about the same thing? Right. So I, I think I know the project that Dr. Orozco is talking about, and so I, I, I know what happens to it. Can you share that? But, so you're, you're talking about the capsules, is, and we're doing uh, gene testing on it, looking for uh, comparing ones that patients that have pseudo exfoliation and patients that don't. Um, I don't I, I probably don't know all the details on exactly where the exactly what genetic testing you're doing and and where where it's going for that. Um, I think the patients don't really I, I think it's just, we're just taking it on the informed consent that they're okay with us doing. It. So I don't think that they know that that's happening. But am, am I wrong, Dr. Orozco? So it's actually called for the capsules for looking at protein. So it's not mm -hmm. even genetic 
So let's get Jeff's comment on that too. I, actually, I wonder if I could ask the group or maybe the residents know the fate of cataracts in general. That is, without a particular research project, arguably again because of unforeseen things, you might want to retain material like that because someone has an idea that maybe later uh, we could discover something. So are they in fact treated as waste and discarded? Yeah, it's waste. It's okay. It's so waste. then. It, so it, then it, it, it's a different absolutely no question that, that <coughs> other than situations such as this, there's enough of it and uh, a lot of it coming through that it, it's destroyed waste, bio, bio hazard waste. So if so, you have an expert here from the institution, and I think your question is so apt, it's kind of every level of concern. Does this constitute research? What's the standard for disclosure, informed consent, opt in, opt out? Jeff, that's a perfect question, I think. Yeah, and so um, my understanding is, at least with respect to pathology laws, if you are sending a sample to pathology in order for them to make a, some sort of ascertainment diagnosis, then those do need to be retained. Sounds like these are things that aren't being evaluated in that sense. Instead of pathology, Nick can remember those days of boring and looking at these. And it was, it was, that we quit that way 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, we still, it's interesting because these issues come up all the time in pathology. We gather specimens on patients with tumors, and then we have people approach us and say, we want to do a study on these tumors and what's going on with them, and we want to do studies and get specimens. And, and it's unclear. It, it depends on which part of the mechanism you go through to get different answers. No. And, you know, we were going to send some specimens to somebody else to do some tumor markers, and we had to go through the IRB, and they came up with all kinds of different things that it was a six month process in order to do this where we've done another study and they said okay so long as you just you identify everything you can just send it to us directly so uh -huh. and, it, and it, it's not clear to this day to me how exactly we go through this particular process yeah well hopefully we're getting a little more consistent but that's a, a good question you know i think my uh if, if i understand how the project is going you're doing research that is basically um benign with respect to and not informative for the patient's clinical status otherwise that might have future implications for the that person and so uh, the risk um, is low obviously the tissue acquisition is low but then the analysis or any secondary research uh, would confer no significant risk so you know at least according to this sort of analysis i think some transparency and disclosure is certainly appropriate doesn't need to be particularly uh, robust and there probably ought to be some system in place that if folks don't like that idea, they can uh, opt out. Now, you don't have to do that if, this, if things are being de-identified uh, because that, that's still the regulations that are in place. I think just the other angle quickly that's changing some of this dialogue is the uh, increasing um, set of obligations to return results to participants. And I think that we, as a community, have not done much uh, thinking about this until relatively recently. And that's sort of the results of the research on the one hand, uh, just to contribute back to people's uh, honor them for their <coughs> contribution, but then also more importantly, the secondary findings. And that's becoming a huge complicated debate. And so if you were doing analysis on those tissues that might in fact indicate whether they're at future risk for worsening disease or prognosis or whatever, um, then that would entail a much higher level of responsibility to let folks know that Here's what we're going to do. We may be calling you later. Here's the implications, et cetera. So it's those sort of factors that I think influence the level of uh, engagement. I think that's actually a lovely note, and it's kind of a future-oriented note. And I just want to end with a paradox, and I think Randy's question kind of brings it up. Uh, one of the solutions to the problem of privacy has been de-identification. On the other hand, one of the costs of that has been the inability to feed back to people information that could be later acquired from their specimens. So the baby, I think, is a fascinating example, right? Our knowledge keeps growing, and it's not inconceivable that from a blood spot, in the future, one might identify a condition which doesn't manifest until later in life, and therefore is preventable or treatable because of new knowledge, but the investigator doesn't have the way to go back to that baby. That's a great right. thing to think about at the end, and I think that's such an interesting model because it's the mom that we're asking there, getting back to Jeff's point about direct um, discussions. It's a very different thing on the issue of privacy, dignity, et cetera, to ask an individual 
right, who has maybe very little or even a lot of literacy, than it is to ask a mom. And I would venture <coughs> that moms would kind of see this a little differently. That is, for them, it might be a greater concern to give up that future benefit because of non-de-identification than to participate in the social benefit that might accrue but specifically exclude their child. So I think this has been a wonderful discussion. Your questions are great. Would you join me in thanking Jeff and the Good, thank you. Yeah. If you want I can grab that. Okay. Don't want it to be mic'd up for you. Don't want to go home. Don't want to go home with it.